Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Neil Strager. Uh, I'm a professor here at the uh, UCL Energy Institute. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the day, Dr. Ben Sharma. Uh, Dr. Sharma is a professor of energy science at the UCL Energy Institute. Uh, he's also the author of the book, uh, Energy Science Lab, Energy and Energy Policy. Uh, Dr. Sharma is also the author of the book, Energy Science Lab, Energy and Energy Policy. Dr. Sharma is also the author of the book, Energy Science Lab, Energy and Energy Policy. Dr. Sharma is also the author of the book, Energy Science Lab, Energy George comes back to UCL. Um, he, is a, he is an alumna of, of UCL. His bachelor's in, in, uh, in economics is from UCL, uh, which he got a first in. Uh, his uh, uh, master's in economics uh, from UCL, which he got a distinction in, uh, is, from, is, is, is from here. So clearly, George knows something about economics, and we're uh, very pleased that he's here. Maybe. Um, George is currently uh, a uh, research economist at the Institute for um, uh, Fiscal Studies. Um, and um, will be uh, presenting on some of his um, current work. Um, let me just, um, uh, prior to turning, um, uh, turning things over to uh, George, just to point out a couple of things. Um, I've been given a, a list of things that I need to mention, so let me make sure I do them all. Um, in terms of fire escapes, at uh, the door you came in, perhaps that's obvious, uh, and also the door at the back of uh, this uh, um, floor are the fire escapes. Uh, um, George will talk for around uh, 40 minutes, uh, we think. Um, if you have clarifying questions, uh, please um, please ask them the more substantive questions, perhaps hold to the end, uh, and then we'll deal with them in a Q&A session. Um, and um, I would like to invite you all to join us for drinks upstairs um, um, after the event, um, and, and, and to some nibbles as well to continue our conversations. Uh, but please, George, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I should probably explain the UCL part on the, beneath my name that I've just come back, I missed it so much, to start doing a PhD, so I'm here again. And I'm going to be talking to you today about joint work uh, at the IFS with Andrew Lester, who's actually just left the IFS for Frontier Economics. Uh, and this is uh, a paper looking at the factors associated with owning domestic energy efficiency measures, which has obviously become a very uh, topical area especially uh, in light of recent news about energy prices and the debate there. So we have ambitious targets to re uh, which require a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 80% relative to 1990 levels by 2050. Now, an efficient way of doing this would be to price carbon. However, this will have adverse distributional effects. If we think that energy is uh, an economic necessity, with low-income households spending a larger part of their budget share on energy than, than richer households, then obviously pricing energy or putting up the prices of energy is going to have negative uh, distribution effects. Now a key strategy to combat both this, these emissions and increasing fuel poverty is to improve the energy efficiency of the UK residential sector. So understanding the barriers which prevent uh, the take up of, these me of energy efficiency measures in this sector is very important. In this presentation we're going to analyse the factors broadly uh, which, which affect the ownership of ener energy efficiency measures and we're going to examine two particular market failures uh, which may be particular problems here including credit constraints and tenant landlord issues. So this is an area that policy has been quite relevant, uh, has been quite active in over the past 15 years or so. From 2000 we had the Decent Homes programme which focused on improving energy efficiency measures uh, and standards in the social housing stock we also had uh, the Landlord's Energy Saving Allowance from 2004, which is a reasonably small policy, it's about £5 million pounds per year, which provides tax exemptions for installing the measures uh, in privately rented properties. We have Warm Front from 2001, which provided, low, uh, which provided grants for low-income benefit recipients to install insulation measures um, in non-social housing. We've also had a long list of supplier obligations. Uh, this, this is from the early 1990s, which oblige enemy, uh, energy companies to install measures for domestic customers. So between 2008 and 2012, and 2009 and 2012, we had CERT and CESP, and these were superseded in 2013 by the energy company obligation, which has largely shifted um, the focus onto solid wall insulation in these, in these houses. Alongside this, we also have the Green Deal, which was launched in 2013. Now, this is particularly relevant for this paper, given that the Green Deal aims to uh, alleviate credit constraints that might prevent the installation of cost-effective measures by providing financing for these. So we're going to look at whether this is a, 
a credit, uh, if credit constraints really are a problem here. Then we also have a wider uh, scope of building regulations, which don't um, say anything about specific measures really, but they do impose minimum standards of energy efficiency on these households. So during this period where policy has been quite active, we can look at the ownership of energy efficiency measures in England. We're going to look at, and, and as we do throughout the, the paper, we're going to look at three uh, energy efficiency measures. They are thick loft insulation, so that's 200 millimetres or more, cavity wall insulation, and full double glazing, so all windows in the house uh, or flat or property are double glazed. So the first thing to notice is that across all these measures, they've increased quite rapidly from 2002 to 2010. So we had about 10% of, of, of dwellings with loft insula uh, thick loft insulation in 2002, about 35% cavity wall, and just over 50% at full double glazing. Now each of these measures have increased by about 20 percentage points over this period. So this may reflect something about policy that's been quite successful. However, as we can see, there's still quite a lot of people who don't have these measures installed. So we might think about why they don't install these measures. So the first potential barrier to take up would be market failures. We have several of these. The first of which are credit constraints. So if you view installing energy efficiency measures uh, as, as a form of investment, you have an upfront cost and then you receive benefits from this over a time stream. Now households may want to install these measures and may want to get these benefits and they deem them cost effective. However, if they can't access the financing to do this, then they can't install these measures. There are also information problems, so households may not be fully aware of these benefits and therefore don't value them to the full extent that they should do. And there may also be landlord-tenant relationship issues where the, the uh, incentives of these two um, types of people are not really aligned properly. So private renters gain the benefits from having cheaper bills through energy efficiency measures, but landlords may not be able to recoup all these benefits in rent, and they pay for them up front. So therefore they're not going to want to install them. We also may think there are hassle costs involved. This may prevent people from wanting to install these measures if they think that it's going to be particularly time consuming. For example, those who live in house uh, for the same property for a long time may store a lot of things in their loft and they don't want to clear that space to install it. And we may also think there are time inconsistencies. So people may in intend to install something in the future. This is a perfectly logical thing to do. However, when they reach this point, they don't actually install these measures. So what exactly are we going to do? Well, we're going to use cross-section household survey data to look at the wider factors associated with the ownership of these three energy efficiency measures. And we're going to explore whether there's any evidence of two particular market failures. So these are the credit constraints and the tenant landlord problems. And just to recap, this is for the three energy efficiency measures I showed before. That's thick loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, and entire house double glazing. So a quick plan, I'm going to look, go through the existing literature quickly and then going to go through my empirical approach. I'm not sure how many people are economists here, I've, it's quite basic and I've tried to uh, not put too many equations in. But we're going to explain the data, we're going to look at our results and see what this means for policy. Ooh. Did I do that? My click has died. So the, looking at past literature, the paper that's most similar to ours is Breckling and Smith, which is a paper from 1992, where they used data from a 1986 English House Condition Survey to look at the ownership of three related efficient energy efficiency measures. So first of all, they look at any loft insulation, not just the thick loft insulation, because it was a lot rarer in this period. They have cavity wall insulation as we do, and double glazing in any window in the home. And they found three main findings in 19, uh, for the 1986 data. First of all, there was very little evidence of any credit constraints, so they didn't find that low income inhibited the take-up of these, of these measures. What they did find was a strong effect of tenure, so those who lived in privately rented and for some measures socially rented houses, um, they were, the take-up for these types of, uh, of households were very much lower. So this suggests this incentive misalignment that I was talking about on the previous slide. They also found more broadly that the characteristics of the property, so the age, the size and the type of the property, played a much more important role than the actual people who lived there. 
So Scott in 1997 replicated this approach in Ireland. Uh, consistently, he found that they, there were significant barriers created by information problems and by this landlord-tenant uh, relationship. But they also found some evidence of low, incomes, uh, low income families being credit constrained. Neo Tower in 2010 found that owner occupiers in Sweden were more likely to install these measures if they have higher income and if they live in older houses. So those living in older houses are more likely to want to install these measures because they're more, less likely to have them before. And Grosch and Vance in 2009 estimated discrete choice models in Germany where they found that many households would be willing to pay for, for measures that were actually subsidised, which would suggest there was some sort of deadweight loss associated with these policies. So moving on to the empirical approach, a very basic economic framework. If we think that households maximise utility, and this depends basically upon how warm they are in their home and the consumption of all other goods and services. The level of warmth in their home is going to depend, depend on two things. So first of all, the actual energy consumption, so how much they consume, and the efficiency with which energy is converted into warmth. This efficiency is dependent, at least in part, on the presence of energy efficiency measures such as insulation. So this actually implies that the level, the decision over how much efficiency measures to install is going to depend upon how much energy you consume, but at the same time the amount of energy that you consume is also going to depend upon which measures that you have. So this suggests that we should be uh, estimating some sort of simultaneous equation model, which is what I have here. So if we think households simultaneously choose energy consumption, which are denoted by C, and the level of insulation, I mean this is the level of all energy efficiency measures really, but for simplicity we'll call it insulation. In the first uh, equation we have the insulation decision, so insulation for household I depends upon the amount of energy that they consume and a set of characteristics that affect the demand for both energy and insulation. So this is going to include both household characteristics and the type of property they live in. In the second equation we're going to have uh, consumption dependent upon how much insulation is in the home, the same set of characteristics that affect both energy and insulation, and we're going to have also a set of characteristics that affect only the demand for energy. Now really what we're interested in here is the effect of beta 2, so what are the effects of these characteristics on the decision to insulate. So a reduced form approach would just substitute 2 into 1, so we, we solve consumption in terms of um, our set of characteristics and then we, we make sure that the, the equation 1 turns into just a, a function of, of the different x's, of the different characteristics. Now we can only interpret the coefficient beta 2, which we were interested in, as a direct impact on insulation of these characteristics if we assume that beta 1 is equal to 0. So this is equivalent to assuming that energy consumption does not affect the insulation decision. So how much you consume doesn't actually affect um, your decision to install these measures. Now obviously this seems like a strange prior, so we're going to need to test this assumption. So how we're going to do this? We're going to use an instrument variables approach to estimate the joint model of energy demand uh, for efficiency measures. So to do this, what we need to do is find a variable that affects the demand for energy, but doesn't affect the demand for, for installing these efficiency measures in any other way other than through the energy channel. So in other words, we want something that affects how much, you, how much energy you want to consume, but should have no direct bearing on if you want to install loft insulation. So for example, we're going to use the number of adults in the household and the number of children in the household split by whether they're um, younger or the older children. So if you think about this here, the number of people in your household is obviously, should obviously have an effect on how much energy you demand. If you have more people, you've got to cook for more people, you have more people in the household, therefore you're going to use more energy. However, that alone shouldn't mean that you demand more efficiency measures. So just because you have more people in the house, other than the fact you're using more energy, it would be, be surprising if they were something like, oh, let's, you know, let's install loft insulation because there's more of us. We're going to use further instruments. We can use whether gas is used for cooking or heating water rather than electricity because you're going to demand different energy. And we're also going to uh, use whether the water tank has an insulating cover. Now, fortunately, we can only test this up to 1996 due to the data not existing beyond this point. And I'm going to talk in, in more detail about the data in a minute. So Breckling and Smith also did this two-step approach to test this with the 1986 data. 
and they found that energy consumption was not endogenous in the insulation equation. So that means that there wasn't a simult simultaneous approach here. They didn't find that your insulation depended upon your, the amount of energy you consumed. And moreover, they found that even the correlation between consumption and the ownership of these measures um, didn't reveal anything significant. So we've extended these results to 1996 and we find very similar results. We don't find that energy consumption matters for how much insulation you install, even when you use these instruments. So given the consistency of these, these results over quite a long period of time, we're going to proceed to just estimate the reduced form models. Now, the lack of data beyond 1996 is frustrating. This is because the data source that we use stopped collecting how much uh, energy people use beyond this point, and so we can't test this. So which, what is the data that we use? Which data? We use cross-sectional survey data from the English Housing Survey. This was the English House Condition Survey until 2008. And we use this between 2002-03 and 2010-11. Now what this does is it doesn't say anything about the actual decision to install these measures, but instead provides a static picture of ownership. So we can see what are the characteristics of the types of people and the types of houses who own these, these measures. And the data contain approximately 8,000 households each year and have information on an extensive survey of household characteristics. So this is uh, things about income, the characteristics of the, house, of the head of household and the composition of the family. They also contain a full physical survey of the dwelling. So a, a qualified engineer has, has gone to the house, records its size, uh, the type of house that it is, and also checks to see the presence of energy efficiency measures. So they see whether they have these measures and then what standard they are, what thickness, things like loft insulation. And in all of our, our work here, we're going to exclude households that are unable to install certain measures. So we know, for example, if, a, if the house has a roof, uh, has, has a loft. So if they don't have a loft, then obviously it's difficult to install the loft insulation. So in actual terms of our st estimation, we estimate a discrete choice model, so we use a probit model here, to analyse the determinants of ownership of each of the three energy efficiency measures. So we include a whole range of household characteristics. So first of all, for the head of household, we include the age, the gender, the ethnicity and employment status. We also include income. This is uh, the same as full income measures that are used for the official fuel poverty statistics. We use the type and the length of tenure, and we record the number of adults and children in the household. We also include a range of property characteristics. So these include the age, the size, and the type of property. So the age focuses on when it's actually built, the size is the size of the floor space, and the type of property is whether it's a semi-detached house, detached, flat, etc. We also see the type of central heating, or first of all we see whether they have central heating, and then the type of central heating used. So as I said, there are around 8,000 people, um, in uh, 8,000 households within our survey. I'm going to point because the, the click thing doesn't work anymore. If you look at our, um, the column on the right, we see this is basically the full sample. So we, almost, we don't exclude anyone really from the full double glazing, as most properties have windows. We then look at cavity wall insulation in the in central column. We see that we drop about 2,500 households each time. And with loft insulation, we drop around one and a half or 2,000 households. And just to reinforce what I was saying before, with our figure where we saw that the, the ownership of these measures were increasing, we can see that for each of these measures from 2002 to 2010, we see about a 20 percentage point increase. So the, uh, the number of these measures being installed uh, have, have gone up significantly over this period. So moving on to our, our results, we're going to do this in three sections. First of all, I'm going to look at the evidence on the existence of the credit constraints. Then we're going to look at the evidence on the effect of our second market failure, which is the effect of uh, tenure and duration. And then we're going to look at a, a broader set of other household and property characteristics. So what evidence is there on the existence of credit constraints? Well, we study the effect of three potential proxies for credit constraints. First of all, we look at what might seem most logical of income. So are, does low income inhibit um, people from installing these measures? 
We also look at whether anyone in the household receives mean-tested benefits and the education level of the head of household. So first, looking at the results for low income, we find measure, uh, our findings are broadly consistent with, with the Breckling and Smith measure, uh, results from 1992. We don't find uh, significant effects of low income households being less likely to uh, own these measures. And in fact, in our last period, between 2008 and 2010, we find that lower income households are actually more likely to own loft insulation. And this is controlling for all these other, other characteristics that we talked about. However, this is inconsistent with cavity wall and double glazing, where we don't find any effects of income. The other results differ across uh, the different measures. We, we do find some evidence of households who receive means-tested benefits being le uh, less likely to own thick cloth insulation, about three percentage points less likely um, than a household who do not receive uh, benefits. However, this isn't the case also for cavity wall and um, double glazing. And we also find that low education households are more likely to own some of these measures, where someone with a degree is less likely. So these are, there's quite a mix of messages here, but in general they don't seem to point to a consistent uh, evidence or consistent story that there are these credit constraints here. And obviously this is a very important message for policies that aim to alleviate credit constraints, given um, that the Green Deal has been implemented this year, and that's one of the main points of the policy, is to, is to really aim at these credit constraints, along with solving informational problems. This is something we should talk about in detail later. We're now going to look at the tenure type and duration. What effects do these have on the ownership of, of the three different measures? So this is looking at our tenant landlord potential market failure. So here we look at the average marginal effects of, the, of tenure type and duration on the ownership of cavity wall insulation for 2008-9 to 2010-11. So you can think of an average marginal effect effectively as relative to some base group. If you are a different group, then you are going to have a X percentage point increase or decrease on uh, the likelihood of owning these measures. So here our base group are owner occupiers who have moved in the last two years. What you can see on the graph, the, the green um, show significant effects at the 90% level, whereas the tan show um, insignificant effects. So what we have, if you look at the right panel, is the, just looking at owner occupiers, this looks at just at the effective duration. So those households who are owner occupiers and have lived in the same house between 6 and 20 years are around 5% less likely to own cavity wall insulation than householders who have just moved. If we move to the middle panel, we see the effect for private renters. Now we see that private renters in general, regardless of their duration, are much less likely to own cavity wall insulation in 2008-9 to 2010-11 relative to our base group of owner occupiers who have recently moved. So these effects are about 10% well, when they've recently moved and for longer uh, for those who've lived between two and five years, it's about 15 percentage points. However, if we look at social renters, we see that the, the effects are the opposite. So, in general, social renters seem more likely to own cavity wall insulation than the owner occupiers. And this is particularly strong uh, for those who have lived between 11 and, well, 11 plus years, particularly for those who've lived more than 20 years in those housing. So it's about 18 percentage points to the effect there. Now this is quite a striking result because if you, there are results from, 2000, from the early period, from 2002, don't suggest this. They think that social renters are, if anything, less likely to own these measures. And the results from Breckling and Smith really did show that they were less likely. Looking at the same effects for loft insulation, we see that there's, there seems to be effective duration on owner-occupiers. So those who have lived for a lot longer in their owner-occupied house are about 10% less likely to own loft insulation than those who have recently moved. In the middle panel, again, we see that private renters are less likely, regardless of their duration. So between 10 and 15% and less likely percentage points, I should say. And for social renters, we see that broadly, although some of the effects are insignificant, they're about 5% more likely to own these measures. Moving on to full double glazing, we see a bit of a mix for owner occupiers. So those who have, who have moved uh, into the house between two and 10 years are slightly more likely to own double glazing relative to those who've just moved. But those who have lived for a lot longer are less likely. 
So this may suggest that it's something that people don't do as soon as they move into a house, but do relatively soon. But if they've lived for a very long time in one house, they, they're unlikely to, to install this double glazing. For private renters, again, we see these effects that they're, they're all significant and they're less likely to have um, full double glazing relative to the owner occupiers. This is particularly the case for those who have, who have lived there for more than five years, they're around 10 percentage points less likely. And again, for social renters, we see broadly that regardless of duration, they are more likely to own full double glazing now than owner occupiers. And this again is a really striking result because they were definitely less likely to before. They were you know, big negative significant effects in 2002 and in, uh, in, in 1986. So just to summarize those, as there's quite a lot of them, the exact effects vary across the different measures. However, we do have uh, find strong evidence that private renters are less likely to own these measures regardless of the measures that we look at. And this really provides a potential focus for future policy uh, where we may think that we, we need to, to regulate this, this type of the market for people to uh, install these measures. We also see that social renters are more likely to own most of these different measures. And this may reflect the success of past policies that have either been targeted explicitly at these groups or have been delivered in, uh, largely f uh, through social housing associations and therefore have been directly taken to these groups. Looking more broadly at other household characteristics, we find that some evidence that the presence of retired people within the household increased the likelihood of ownership of these measures. Particularly households headed by retired people are more likely to own loft and cavity wall insulation. And this seems quite logical. If you think that people who are retired are more likely to spend more time at home or value warmth just intrinsically higher, then they're the people who get larger benefit from these measures. We also find little evidence of an effect of the other head of household characteristics. So age, once you control for this employment or this retired status, employment status and ethnicity don't seem to really matter. We also find in, in, inconsistent and, and almost entirely insignificant effects of household composition, so number of people and relative ages. Moving on to characteristics of the, of the property rather than the household, we're now going to look at the effects of property age on ownership of these measures. So again, we're looking at the average marginal effects here. Our base group are houses that are, or properties that are built between 1965 and 1974. So we see that those houses that are built before 1918 are generally much less likely to own this measure uh, than those built between 1965 and 1974. This is about 20, between 30 and 20 percentage points less. Something slightly strange happens in the middle where those who, houses that were built between 1945 and 1964 are slightly more likely to own these measures than those between 65 and 74. We also see in the 80s that these uh, houses are less likely to own uh, cavity wall insulation, but post-1990 we see this significant effect. So in general it seems that our newer houses um, are more likely to own these measures, particularly when you look at the really uh, older parts of our housing stock. The effects are much smaller and, and often insignificant when we look at loft insulation. So we see those really, uh, the older houses are less likely, but the, the effects are much smaller. What's interesting is if you look at the houses that are built post-1990, they're almost 20% more likely to have this thick loft insulation than those uh, built between 1965 and 1974. And if we look at the ownership of full double glazing, I like this graph because it behaves properly. <laughs> They all go in the right order. If you see, the, again, those built really before 1918 are, are 20 to 30% less likely to have, percentage points less likely to have the measure than those in 1965-74. This is also the case for those between 1990 and 1964. We see some small uh, insignificant effects between 1975 and 1990, and then we see this, this really large increase in probability for houses built post-1990. So it really does seem to matter when the houses were built. So those that are really old don't have these measures. Those that are newer are much more likely to have these measures, particularly if you look at full double glazing. Very, very briefly, the first one, the, the, the uh, cavity wall. Most of the houses would not have a cavity wall. So, so I should say that... Pre-1900. So I know you didn't take them account, but 
Uh, you might get one one percent of having. Sure. I mean, as I said, we can. I should have stated this more explicitly. We we control for them, so we don't include them in our our measures here. So this is controlling for all other things, and we uh, lose houses that are, are built without cavity walls. Hard to treat cavity walls. Just they're built in such a way that they're difficult. We haven't explicit. We haven't. Uh, Put those in as different as different things. I mean, that may be the explanation for why these uh, properties are less likely to have them if if um, they're older. But then that may also be a you know a, a separate target for policy to to hit. So if they think that there's a particular failure on on older properties that have these hard to treat cavities. Then there may be something else to do. I've also got one table. So if you don't like figures, I'm sorry. Um, again, we're looking at the average marginal effects, so same interpretation as before. What I've highlighted here in red are the results for, for the effects of property type on cavity wall insulation. So if we look at the last period again between 2008 and 2010, we find that relative to our base group of semi-detached houses, those are the mid-terraced, uh, converted flats or purpose-built flats are less likely to own cavity wall insulation whereas those that are detached or bungalows are more likely. Whereas end terraced, we don't really see any difference. Now this is, again, quite logical if we think that in terms of exposure uh, and wall space, mid-terraced, converted flat and purpose-built flats are going to be a lot less exposed than semi-detached houses, and therefore may get less benefit from cavity wall insulation, whereas detached and, and uh, bungalows are you know, more likely to get value from these. And if we look at loft insulation or even full double glazing, we see that the results are, they change slightly. There are some significant effects still, so end terraced houses and bungalows are more likely to own loft insulation, whereas purpose-built flats are less likely. And full double glazing, the uh, end and mid terraced houses are more likely to own these measures, whereas converted flats are again less likely. Looking more broadly at other property characteristics, properties with central heating are more likely to own specific measures, in particular uh, full double glazing. Properties that use solid fuels for heating are also less likely to own double glazing and cavity wall insulation. So they're using a less efficient fuel in the first place and they have less of these efficient measures. We also find quite consistent regional effects over time. Interestingly, London households are significantly less likely to own cavity wall insulation or double glazing relative to other parts of the country. And we, know, we find no evidence for significant effects of property size. So this is a bit surprising as you think that a larger property may require uh, larger spending on heating. We don't see this any evidence in, in higher measures. So in conclusion, the importance of different factors varies across different measures. So this might suggest a policy that there's little scope for sort of a one-size-fits-all and instead it should be targeted at different measures um, and for different groups. There's also very little evidence of credit constraints as a barrier to take up. We don't find any effect of, of low income uh, constraining people from taking up these measures. Although we do find some evidence on cavity wall insulation for means-tested benefits. Now this is an important message for policies, as I said before. If we think the Green Deal is, is targeted to aim, uh, is aimed to target credit constraints, then we may be worried uh, that the policy is not ideal. This may result in, in low take-up or perhaps deadweight loss. If people are installing measures under, this, under the scheme that they, wouldn't have, they, that they would have done regardless. However, there are other benefits to the Green Deal. Um, information may improve because of it and therefore it's difficult to weigh up the pros and cons of this. What we do find is that tenure plays a very important role. These results are consistent over time across all the measures that we find private renters are much less likely to own energy efficiency measures than owner occupiers or social renters. Now this seems like a very important role for policy to play in correcting this market failure. And then in general, property characteristics are more associated uh, with ownership than household characteristics. So the age and the type of the property seem to be much more important than who lives in the property. So these may be a target for future policy. So how could policy be improved? Well, 
first of all, looking at our tenant uh, landlord problems, we could perhaps introduce regulatory measures to require landlords to install these energy efficiency measures. This would address this failure. The current policy does look to be moving to, uh, in, in this direction. The Energy Act 2011 uh, brings in um, policies that will come in in the future. So in 2017, the Green Deal uh, will be much more accessible for private, private tenants. And also by 2018, uh, landlords will have to um, make sure that the properties that they rent out are a certain standard of energy efficiency. We could also target specific groups of specific measures. So loft insulation uh, was particularly low. The ownership rates for long duration owner, uh, owner occupiers, the, those people who've lived in houses for a long time. And perhaps you could reduce hassle costs associated with the installation of these, of these measures by helping them in some other way of the policies. It also seems that we should target the efficiency measures on specific properties rather than groups. I mean, this is conditional on if your objectives of your policy are to really improve the efficiency of the housing stock rather than say maybe a distributional impact then you should probably target older properties properties which use solid fuel and properties that have no central heating at all yeah. key messages thank you Thank you, George. That was an extremely interesting and clear presentation, and to time, which is uh, uh, not something that all of our seminar speakers manage to do. Uh, I'd like to open the um, uh, floor for questions. Um, George, if, if you want to point to people, I just ask if you're not from UCL, um, just please say your name and where you're from. Uh, but perhaps we just start with the gentleman at the back as he had his hand up. Uh, Andrew Clouth, uh, Campus on Earth, work for sustainability. sustainability. Thank you very much. Two quick questions just to clarify. Um, the first one is, in your um, uh, uh, testing, did you actually look at educational attainment of uh, occupiers of these properties? And then the second one, just in this, and it sounds really banal, is did you look at the method of procurement for these measures that people went through? Because um, one of the things that sort of gets me through that is that lower income households are probably more likely to say yes to door-to-door -door salesmen and uh, it's only in, in, in recent times that that sort of thing may have been dealt with and I just wonder whether you've you managed to sort of look at those sorts of issues as well. So the educational attainment, we, we have the level of education for the head of household, um, so whether they have finished compulsory school, whether they have A-levels uh, or some a degree or other measures of higher education, so we do include that. There weren't, uh, I mean, there was, there was some effects of that with actually low education households being more likely to own some of these measures, which is perhaps not what we expected. In terms of method of procurement, unfortunately, because we use cross-sectional data, we only know whether someone owns it, uh, owns the measure. We, we don't really know when it's installed or, or how they install it. So, I mean, that's a drawback to using cross-sectional data, but you can just see, you know, what the characteristics of the people who own it are rather than what's driven that decision. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Gwitri, I'm from the Energy Saving Trust. I'm afraid I'm a bit of a, um, a geek when it comes to the um, English Housing Survey. Mm -hmm. so, but one of my questions was, I, I'd slightly challenge the, the question that credit is not, um, I'm not, I don't know from why, and it doesn't seem to be the key uh, barrier, but um, when you look at the policies that you previously mentioned, such as so warm front, um, eek, uh, currently eco and cess, those kinds of things. Those policies have specifically gone to target low income households, warm zones and so on and so forth. And um, because of the way that the English housing surveys, you say you don't know how people have acquired those things. Mm -hmm. Is it not, have you tried to look at, well actually previous installation rates, how much of those have gone into low income households? Um, because I think particularly those measures um, for the energy supply has been quite, um, uh, for them to meet their EEC and CERT targets, they've really had to try and focus in on those groups anyway. So naturally we would see low income areas having high uptake of things like capital and interest. Um, so first of all, it's 
good point, valid, valid point. Um, the results from 1986 and the Breckling and Smith originally, which is before these policies kicked in, so I think EEC is 92, um, we didn't find evidence of, of low income being a, a big barrier then. Um, you're quite right that lots, I mean, most of these policies have been targeted to lower income households, and that may, the fact there aren't these credit constraints or they don't appear to be, that may be, you know, that these policies have been more successful than we, uh, than, you know, they are, they have been successful. We also do control for things like, so, uh, you know, tenure, so social housing and things like that, and a lot of these measures that were directed at low income households have been targeted, say, at social, ha social housing, either explicitly or lots of them were delivered in association with, with uh, social landlords. So that may take out some of the effect of that. I don't know if that uh, answers everything. Satisfied? No? <laughs> yeah. Mostly. It sounds, it sounds like a wine conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, Mike Fidel, UCL. Um, just quickly interested in the owner-occupier segment, mm -hmm. whether there's any information on what proportion of those are leaseholders and freeholders, because my suspicion of I'm, I'm, I'm a leaseholder and I can't do anything to the fabric. Okay. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, I, don't, I don't think in the data that we have that information. If we do, I haven't looked at it, so I'm afraid I don't know. Yeah. I'm just interested to know what the head of the household is. So the head of the household is, well, it's the household reference person. It's generally uh, the main earner. But, um, I mean, it differs. Like, they have to declare who the head of the, the household reference person is. So when your household is contacted, you do that. Hi, uh, my, my question is more of a theory. Um, I was wondering, because you mentioned the landlord-tenant relationship. Um, as you said, the landlord generally pays for the energy efficiency measures. Sure. And therefore, because the, te the tenant then pays the bills, they don't really get the benefits. If this as a theory, the landlord pays the energy bills within the rent, ignoring the fact that the tenants could then need as much energy as they wanted, they're paying for it. There was a cap. Quite possibly. I mean, they would. This, the incentives would be better aligned there, in the sense that if they do think of installing these measures, all else equal, their tenants are going to use less energy. Then, obviously, they, if they're paying their bills, then they're going to recoup the benefits from um, paying for the installation of these measures. Of course, they can't. Con I mean, they don't control what the uh, response of the, of the tenants is, so they may not realise what the benefits are, and therefore will continue to use the same amount of energy, and therefore the landlord wouldn't get the same, wouldn't get the, the benefits that they expect from it. But I think, in theory, then yes, that w I mean, you know, it is a better alignment of incentives than it was before because they recoup the benefits. Yeah. Tony Edwards, architect, rehabilitation. Uh, could you clarify a bit more what your priorities were in doing the study? Because clearly you have selected a certain number of criteria of cubby wall, loft, uh, and double glazing, which are, are, are by no means necessarily the most significant countrywide in if you want to cut carbon emissions in the country or you want to cut fuel quality, we, 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 we sort of priorities I mean, for example, I work in inner London where probably 70% of homes are not cavity wall, they're solid old wall buildings, and 90% are in conservation areas where you wouldn't be able to insulate them properly anyway, uh, and also an awful lot of them, I don't know what proportion, don't have a loft because they're apartments of a multi-storey building of which there might be just five storeys on average around this area, uh, no no loft. Uh, I mean, clearly there's an awful, and there's also, of course, um, people in fuel poverty now uh, who need more help maybe, maybe than uh, some rich person who is so rich that he doesn't care what the uh, energy costs. Uh, uh, what, what were your priorities and uh, are there other intentions to carry out these other looking at these other aspects of uh, uh, fuel 
So, I mean, we can look at the data to look at other aspects. I'm not entirely sure what is actually covered in the data there. Um, the reason for looking at something like loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, they have consistent time series across all that, across the period that we look at. Uh, past work has also looked at this, so if we were hoping to to update uh, results that we saw from the Breckling and Smith results in 92, it makes sense to look at consistent uh, measures. So those were the really our priorities in doing that. So you're finding but it'd be what, where you might target uh, uh, government pressure. Is that a priority in your study? In what sense, sorry? Well, you're looking at uh, what aspects you said uh, uh, private renters don't have much energy benefits, uh, there may be something that the government might target uh, and, and other similar comments. Uh, you're looking at where the government might intervene. Sure. Okay, well, I mean, historically, these the supply obligations, things like CERT and CESP recently, have focused mostly upon installing things like loft insulation and cavity wall insulation. And, you know, there are estimates that there are, there are still quite a lot of these easy to treat cavity walls that are still there. Um, so I think that is relevant to policy. In terms of if those are the things they've historically been doing, I mean, I, I realise that the, the the more the updated version of so the latest supply obligation has shifted more towards doing solid wall insulation. So I agree that's something that would be good to look at in the future. Mm. Thank you. I, 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 I thought I could see a few hands, and as, as, we're, as we're moving towards six, um, perhaps we can start one, two, only two questions, three. Forward. So, so, so why don't we take the doors forward and see where we go, but perhaps if we start here and, and move around. Sure. Do you know any way work that uh, factors in uh, who's asking or who's telling Australia the uptake of these measures? I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head about those. Um, I assume, well I imagine there'd be quite so there'll be some more recent work that will be coming up with that sort of thing, given that the policies have moved towards things like the Green Deal, where you have lots of providers, uh, you have lots of different companies who are offering assessments. But I, I don't know personally which... Uh, I mean, there's... From other countries where... Uh,